sacrifice that you made for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Chad. So I'll try not to drag this part out. I wasn't even going to say anything out loud about it, but it's just too exciting for me. Um, up until 2012, I had just studied Judges, reading through Judges like, like a normal book of the Bible, like a history book. First this happened, and then this happened, and this happened after that. And um, in 2012, I can even tell you it was in August of 2012, um, I came across this article that I talked about in our first class. It's, it's a two-part article called The Fall of the Family in the Book of Judges that really opened up the world to me of reading, not just Judges, really, for that matter. I think Judges was the first book for me that I started to figure out. Um, this is not just a linear history book, first this, then this, then this. It's a sermon, and it's a message. There, we're not just saying, here's a guy named Othniel, and this is what he did. There's a message here for us. And in and, and 2012, that was eye-opening for me to, to begin to read books of the Bible in that way. And so I told you I've gone through the list, and I've preached through judges several times in different places and all of this. And, uh, and I've always... I've never figured out Ehud. Um, he's the hardest one for me. I, every, every other one I read through and it seems pretty clear, pretty easy what the message is and how there's points and I know how to do it. Everything's good. And I've never been able to, to get Ehud. I read the story, which we'll read in just a second. And it's a neat enough story. But I say, how does it fit into Judges? What's the point here? I, I, I know that this is how God presents his message, but what's the message? I don't know what I'm supposed to take away from this. And, um, and so I probably, not probably, I've put more time into Ehud than any other judge. And I was walking my dog at 730 on Saturday night. And it hit me uh, last Saturday. I was just walking. I know where I was on the sidewalk. And I thought, oh. I know what to do with Ehud. It was like a lightning bolt. And so I'm really excited because tonight, tonight's class feels to me like the culmination of eight years of work. This is what it feels like tonight. Not saying it's the best class ever, but it feels like a really big deal to me. So I'm excited about it. Um, and hopefully, hopefully we can go through this in such a way that is so simple and clear that when this class is over, you say, really it took you this long to figure that out? That's the goal. If we can, if we can reduce something to its simplest, clearest point, then I think we've got there. So I hope that's, that's what I would like to accomplish for tonight. Um, let's start with the reading. And um, let, me, let me just remind you, We've done two introductions. We've done Othniel, who is an ideal judge, and the ideal picture of what, um, what a man, what a husband, what a leader in Israel is supposed to be. Um, and we're doing this declining picture. I'm not sure that Ehud is in the decline yet. Uh, we're still going to be looking at some at some good stuff tonight. So. As I read through, I'm going to read the text, verses 12 through 30. You're asking yourself, what's the message? What's the point? How does Ehud fit into judges? How does Ehud teach me about leadership, and especially male leadership? What am I supposed to get from this? These are some of the questions that we ask. So let's start in verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute uh, by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, 
and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes, and he presented the tribute to the Eglon king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, and when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in the cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly. And the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. And there lie their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed. And he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sirah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Okay, I'll give you the first thought. Um, what do you see? Um, what are some of the major points? What are your major takeaways? What are your questions? Uh, you can have the first word in this. And, and this is just kind of a warning. As soon as I get rolling, I doubt there will be much stopping on my part tonight. I got a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> so this is your chance. Anybody have any just open-ended thoughts about this one? I mean, what, in, what, in, what jumps out at you? There's a couple of sentences where you're like, okay, I need to know that, Dave. And you could find it really easy on all of them. I'm looking at chapter 4 right now in verse 3. They pressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. And just go through the judges. That's a great point. I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've ever zeroed in on that point, Dave, just to say, why did it take you so long? <laughs> and why did you keep going back? Yeah, it's just gross. I'm thinking about that. I'm curious why God mentioned that. He's saying it could be a great blessing right now if you just cry out mm -hmm. to have the relief. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to write that in my notes and plagiarize it. I like that point. Mark, you looked like you had something you were. Um, you've talked before about this being having some uh, military um, points in it, you know, leadership and military uh, leadership. Um, but the fact that he's left-handed, and from a military standpoint, that probably Eglon may not have even been suspecting 
what he was getting ready to do because he was left-handed. He, he was probably used to a threat from a right-handed guy. So a threat coming from a left-handed guy, maybe he didn't even realize uh, it was a threat. And he had just paid him a tribute, so he'd already was in subjection to Eglon by paying him a tribute. So, you know, there was just the, that stood out as Yeah. Let's do this. Um, my Bible doesn't have notes, this new Bible that I've been using. Um, look in your Bible at verse 15. Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. Does anybody have a note next to a left-handed man in your Bible? Literally, the Hebrew says restricted in his right hand. That's how you would read that. So here is Eglon restricted in his right hand. And our versions say a left-handed man. Um, I don't know if this is worth, uh, I don't know if this is worth zeroing in on, but do you remember when Jacob, when Rachel finally had Benjamin and she died in that childbirth process? And she said, I'm going to name this child Ben-Oni. Um, He's the, he's the son of my sorrow or something like that. And Jacob says, no, Benjamin will be the son, Benjamin, the son of my right hand. And so I wonder, Benjamin, name, the son of my right hand, is called a left-handed man restricted in his right hand. We'll talk about that in just a second. But it should make us say, something's going on here. Um, I don't know what it is. Something's going on here. Another thought? Any others? Yeah? Luke? Yeah, that, that kind of ramps up a little bit too, doesn't he? In verse 19, I have a secret message for you, O king. And then in verse 20, I have a message from God for you. And that's when he gets up. Um, I'll just do this one real quick because this is what I've always done. I've always made this my point. I think that this is worth noting in your Bible. And, and it's a good point to make. It's just not the one that I'm going to make tonight. In verse 12, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon. Let's not miss that this is not just a bad set of circumstances uh, for Israel. And this is one of the answers... Whenever we get into deeper in the book and we start looking at Jephthah, and I'm going to badmouth Jephthah, and I'm going to badmouth Samson, and people are going to say, but the Spirit of the Lord, it says in the text that the Spirit of the Lord is on these guys. And, and, and what I will point you back to is if you say, how, how, do, how are you going to say these are bad guys when it says the Spirit of the Lord are on them? This is also the Lord's doing. And, and you see it over and over again, and I would, I'm not going to go here, but in Isaiah chapter 10... And verse 5 is my favorite place in all the Bible where God talks about Assyria and how Assyria is God's hand to accomplish his will. And they're wicked and they're evil. And God says, when I'm done with them, I'm going to destroy them. But they are doing God's will. Uh, and so Eglon is doing God's will. And when God is finished, he's going to be um, in um, a, a, a dead pile of feces on the floor whenever it's all over. Um, and so um, God's will is ultimately accomplished here. That's a lesson all by itself that we always need to remember. God is in control. Okay, let me get into some of these things here real quick, just that I will show you. I think I have about four things and I doubt we'll get through them all, but number one, Ehud, the left-handed man. Look at Judges 20. Judges chapter 20 and verses 12 through 17. Probably it's, it's a, a little bit bigger context. Um, yeah, let's just read it. I hate to read the whole thing, but we need to see what's going on here because we're not to Judges 20 yet. The tribes of Israel sent men throughout all the tribe of Benjamin. Remember, um, Ehud is a Benjaminite. And it's the Benjaminites who have a problem in chapter 20. 
Um, and they're saying, what evil is this that has taken place among you? Now, therefore, give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjaminites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. Then the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities of Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities that day 26,000 men who drew the sword. Remember that number. Benjamin calls 26,000 men. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Restricted in their right hand. Um, I think one of the very first times that I did judges, I talked about restricted in their right hand. And it's kind of like uh, my handicap, maybe. I think is a misunderstanding on my part, but... That's what God does. He uses weak people throughout Judges. And so maybe it means that this guy, that's why he makes him such a good assassin is because he doesn't look like he's a threat. Um, but, but that doesn't really work, does it? In, in verse 16, it says, Among all these in Benjamin were 700 chosen men who were restricted in their right hand. Seems like this is a Benjamin thing. Um, the men of Israel... I'm sorry, everyone could sling a stone at a hare and not miss. And the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men who drew the sword. Uh, 400,000 against 26,000. And for the first two days, Benjamin won. These guys aren't messing around. Ehud is a part of this, I think, is what we're supposed to be thinking about. We're supposed to know. Um, one more thing, look at 1 Chronicles chapter 12. You can see another reference to this left-handed thing. 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. These are the men who came to David at Ziklag while he could not move about freely because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men who helped him in war. They were bowmen and could shoot arrows and sling stones with either the right or the left hand. They were Benjaminites. Saul's kinsman. Um, and remember, whenever Israel chose a king, they wanted to choose someone who would lead them in battle, who looked like a warrior, chose a Benjaminite, Saul. Now what do you think about restricted in the right hand? What's that sound like to you? There is an event. I mean, obviously, I mean, especially ancient people specifically. If you look, if you look at this, you can you can um, you can just Google this and see it. Imagine this is the ancient city of Lachish. Um, if you look at Lachish on a map, the city gate looks like this. In the ancient world, people made the gates to their city in that way, specifically. Imagine if you are an army of right-handed people carrying a sword and you have to make that corner. <laughs> how are you going to do that with an army? Or bowmen. How are your bowmen going to make that corner? Dead. Every single one of them. But what happens if you train an army of lefties to make that corner? Um, restricted in the right hand sounds to me, and this is the point that I'm going to grab onto, sounds to me like I tied my right hand up so that I could train and become proficient with my left. It seems to fit the context here that um, I'm going to prepare myself, some of the key words, I'm going to specifically prepare myself to be able to do this thing. And here is Ehud, a man who has done this, a man restricted in his right hand, one of these left-handed warriors, and, and this is, I mean, I've got the note on there for you. Perhaps the Benjaminites purposefully trained several of their young men to be left-handed warriors by restricting the use of their right hand from an early age so the left hand would become dominant. Left-handed men would have a distinct military advantage, especially when attacking city gates. Should have read that first. Um, but uh, number one, point number one. Ehud in this story is a man who was prepared, who had trained, and had got himself ready to do the job that needed doing. 
He didn't just wake up one morning and say, I think I'm going to go assassinate the king of Moab. He was prepared to do what needed doing. Took me eight years to come up with that sentence. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound uh, like much, but, but to say, what is, I know the left-handedness is a big deal. It's a major part of the story, but why? I think that's why. Anything you want to say about that before I move on? There's something else I want to show you that's neat about this story. Okay, number two. This story is dripping with sacrifice language. And this is one of those things, this is why I'm going to do a lot of talking, and I won't probably read all of these references, but I, I don't want you to just think that I'm making it up, so I'll show you. Um, all of this stuff. But if you were, if you were a Hebrew speaker or a Hebrew writer or reader, reading this or listening to this text in the way that God gave it in Hebrew, I don't think that you could possibly miss some of the things that just fly right over our head as we, as we read through this. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, what I've done in my Bible, just in case this is something that you think ends up being valuable to you. Um, so here's the text. This is a text block on my page. And this is the wide margin. In the wide margin, I put sacrifice, language, and imagery. And then I highlighted it with a color. And then what I've done in the text is I've highlighted all the words in this text in that color that are sacrifice language or sacrifice imagery. If you, if you choose to see this or, or want to pay attention to this. Oops. <laughs> yeah, there, there's my point. Man, it took me eight years and I just totally blew it. Would you just enjoy it for a second? Just entertain me. Next. Sacrificial overtones are emphasized in this section. The story as a whole plays on the notion of sacrifice. So let's go through and, and look at some of these examples. Number one, the people of Israel served Eglon. That word served is used all throughout the Old Testament. But this is a word that you see over and over in Judges in chapter 2. Um, in Joshua's day, when Israel was doing what they were supposed to do, they served the Lord. Mostly in the book of Judges, they served the Baals and they served other gods. This is just religious language. Here they served Elon. That's not a huge point. But it fits in whenever you see a lot of these other ones. Here is a huge point. The name Eglon means... Calf, calf man. Um, his name is Fat Baby Calf. That's Eglon. That's what that's what that's what Eglon means. And you can see some of this. Eglon is closely associated phonetically to calf or heifer, and to young bull or ox. So the young part of this and the calf. That's the baby calf. Um, this phonetic pun might be stretched into the sound is round, fat would be a good way, especially in this story, fat baby calf. Um, and so Eglon is the story of a fatted calf who's ready for slaughter. Sacrifice language. Don't, don't miss this point. Um, you're welcome to interrupt me. And we go through any of these things. You can interrupt and... Um, we can um, talk about your different ones. Let me see. I'm behind on my notes here, so I got to get caught up. Uh, tribute. One, two, three, four, four different times. And, and they're all close together, too. Look at verse 17. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting his tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. Um, I missed one earlier back in verse 15. The people of Israel sent tribute. When you're reading in the Bible and God says tribute, 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 tribute. You're supposed to pay attention to that. Um, and so here's the word tribute. The sons of Israel sent 
to Eglon, this tribute, a common word for a present or a gift becomes technical term in at least two ways. Politics, this is Dave's thing, sending tribute to the king. This is what we think of. But also, it's worship where it represents a food offering. And in all of these places in the Old Testament and more, the tribute is the food offering that Israel offers to God. The sacrifice language. And so here is Ehud making his sacrifice to the fatted baby cow who's ready for sacrifice. Sacrifice language. Eglon was a very fat man. There's a whole sentence all by itself. And, and you're reading through this story and my reaction is, well, that was kind of unnecessary. <laughs> Why do... It's mean. <laughs> You're reading through the story and it's like, here's a sentence all by itself. Oh yeah, he was a big fatty. I don't know why you had to do that. Well, here's the reason why the word fat is used over and over again. It's used elsewhere of fatted cattle or sheep. Eglon is portrayed as a fatted calf going to the slaughter. This image of physical obesity is rendered even more vivid in 2022. Uh, with the common, uh, comment that Ehud stabbed him, his sword was smothered in fat. It's another word, but still a sacrifice word. Most often, this word signifies a good quality animal ready for sacrifice. Here, a fat animal. Not fat in the offensive way that sometimes we may use the word, but sacrifice word. We talked about this one in just a second ago, whenever he rammed the sword in, it says the fat closed over the blade. Exact same thing. Ehud stabs Eglon with the hilt uh, of the dagger penetrating the belly. The term translated fat is the sacrificial term used for the choicest parts of the sacrifice. And you can see all the places in the Old Testament where that's true. When Israel is finished with this process, not only do they kill the fat king, fat not being an offensive word, but a sacrifice word, they kill all the fat soldiers who are also ready for sacrifice. Look at verse 29. They killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong and able-bodied men. And this is the same thing that you can see about that. The term translated vigorous normally means fat or stout. And even in this part, it, sacrifice is the idea. So, I think, I think that's the last one that I have. In my Bible, I've got served. This is the highlighted sacrifice words. Served, eaglon, tribute, tribute, fat, tribute, tribute, fat, all strong, able-bodied men. You read through the story and it's dripping with sacrifice language. Now what's the point? Now that you know that. Chad? Yeah, I've got Chad. Mm, let's see. Yeah, this is at the top of this one. Modern English translations have unfortunately missed the mark on the meaning of this parenthetical statement. The word fat occurs 14 times in the Old Testament and never refers to obesity, but rather refers to health, prosperity, or attractive appearance. And the main point here. The narrator is thus informing us that Eglon is not an easy target, but rather a beefy or strapping man, which explains why he would need little guards and all this stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a good catch. But especially, not just fat, beefy, healthy, but ready for sacrifice. What's the point here with the sacrifice language? What are we getting at? What has Israel not been doing for 18 years? Well, 
when uh, in Leviticus three, when you read about the peace offering, uh, the peace offering is dripping with fat. Um, when you read, read read about the different sacrifices, the peace offering sacrifice in Leviticus three is the one that mentions the fat the most, and the fat is to be offered, and the fat is to be burned, and the fat is to be uh, part of the offering. Um, so Israel had been serving Eglon. Now Eglon is the fatted calf, basically, being um, sacrificed with blood and fat and everything. Anyway, I just want to read something in the commentary. Yeah, do, do, the, please. The peace offering. This a peace offering achieves and expresses peace or fellowship between an offerer and the Lord. The ritual as a whole symbolizes a communion meal that is held between the offerer, the officiating priest, and the Lord. Um, then this offering was a time to remember and reaffirm the covenant relationship between the Lord and Israel. But maybe this symbolizes that too. You know, they're, they're going from this situation back into where they're reaffirming their covenant relationship with God. Yeah. And he happens to be the sacrifice. He's man. the sacrifice. Yeah. We have decided, God, that we no longer want to continue in this 18-year cycle of doing this. We're ready to serve you. And so now we're going to turn to the Lord. And there's, there's levels of this, different levels of this. Ehud, I would think, I mean, if I'm Ehud in this situation, Ehud offers himself as a sacrifice. A, a lone man to do a difficult task that nobody else has done for 18 years. Who knows if he's going to make it alive out of this situation to assassinate a king. No, no, no. You go ahead. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, he himself has said, I will sacrifice myself to accomplish this goal. And the goal that I am sacrificing for is to sacrifice both to the Lord and for the Lord. Um, it's the sacrificial language is this, this man who has intentionally prepared himself to do this task of sacrificing <clears throat> for God. Sacrifice. You have to use the word sacrifice in, in this text. I don't know if there's anything to this or not, but in verse, because it seems like this was already planned out, but in verse 19, after they've given the tribute to the king, Ehud turns around at some idols and comes back and it's, I don't know if that's just a marker, but it almost makes me think like he's walking out, he sees the idols and it's kind of like, no, he's going to turn back and make this sacrifice to God and the people are, it, it's sort of symbolic maybe of the people making a turn back toward God and not, you know, being infested in the same way. Yeah, no, that's good. That's, that's a hard one because we don't know what the idol, the idol word there is weird. And there's a million different ways of figuring it. They could be, they could be just normal boundary markers. They could be Joshua stones that he set up after they came out of the Jordan River. And so maybe he sees Joshua's memorial stones and says, no more. And we won't have time to talk about this. But in verse 13, Moab is happening. This whole thing is happening in the city of Palms. That's Jericho. This whole thing is a big symbolic story. So maybe it's idols. Maybe he gets mad. Maybe he gets frustrated. Maybe he's reminded of the covenant. I don't know. But the point is what you say. It's a turning back to the Lord. Which is a good way to see it. Um, what did I say on this? Ehud is a prepared, intentionally prepared person to sacrifice himself and to lead Israel to sacrifice to the Lord and for the Lord. Um, which is a, is a mark... Uh, change in the way that they've been acting for the last couple years. Um, Ehud is the leader who points the people in this direction. I think of Romans 12 and verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Um, this is going to be especially important when you think about Ehud who sacrifices himself in this way. Next week when we start talking about Barak or Barak, 
I don't have anything nice to say about him. He has to be told what to do by Deborah. And then Deborah says, get your army and go fight. And he says, I will if you go with me. Um, and then Gideon, over and over again, Gideon wants assurances. How do I know that you're really with me, God? Ehud doesn't need any of that. He's, he's prepared himself. He's ready. He's going to lay it on the line. And he's going to serve God. And he's going to lead people to serving God. So there's two things up to this point. He's prepared. He's sacrificing himself and sacrificing to and for the Lord. Any other words on that one? Um, number three, you seek cooperation. This is a huge, huge theme all throughout um, the book of Judges. We've already seen it with Judah and Simeon. We talked about it with Caleb and Oxa and Othniel, cooperation, all working to the same goal. Look at verse 27. When Ehud arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. That's more Jericho language, by the way. Sounding the trumpet, because God's about ready to do something. He sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader, and he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized uh, the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow, allow anyone to pass over, and they killed all of these people. Notice especially in verse 27, the hill country of Ephraim. This might help with this. Here's, here's Jericho. Jericho is in the tribal allotment of Benjamin, which is why Ehud, a Benjaminite, would be called to do this job. And you can see that Ephraim is their next door neighbor. So um, Ephraim is running away from Jericho, passes through Gilgal. See the hills? See the mountains on the map? goes into the hill country and says to Ephraim, come on, let's go do this thing. And Israel works together. Here is a leader who calls Israel to work together. Um, I, don't, I don't want to, to spoil all of this stuff later on, um, but whenever we get to Jephthah, Jephthah also is going to set up a border um, at the fords of the Jordan. Only he's doing it to kill the Ephraimites. Remember the Shibboleth, Sibboleth thing? Um, it's going to go downhill from here, but this is a prepared man sacrificing in lots of different ways and leading God's people and cooperating together to accomplish their goal. Anything you want to say about cooperation? you see a picture of complete obedience. I'm tempted to think, I mean, let's just look at the easy stuff. The easy stuff is verse 29. They killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong and able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. We've already heard that language before, up to this point. They did everything they were supposed to do. I'm inclined to think that this also is why we get the story about taking the sword and ramming it all the way in, all the way through, and leaving it there. It's a picture of doing the job all the way. It's a literary picture. Here is a guy who does what needs to be done. Um, and so uh, here is a picture of this, this complete... Um, obedience. There's also stuff about the 10,000. It seems preferable, however, to treat 10,000 as a literary figure, which means 10,000 indicates something like Israel achieved total victory, complete, total. It's a picture of what he did. So even though there's more that I'd like to talk about, we've only got a couple minutes left. What do you see here now with Ehud? If you think about Ehud in this way that he's been pictured for us in Judges 3, how does he fit into the book of Judges? And especially, we still, I know that it's frustrating, but we still have not even got to the point. We will next Wednesday when we start to say, 
the problem in Israel is a failure of male leadership. But we're seeing here with Othniel and Ehud, we're seeing two men who paint a picture of what it looks like to get it done. They prepare themselves. They sacrifice themselves. They, they encourage cooperation and working together and not division and civil war. And they do what they're supposed to do, all of it, to the complete end of the task. It's a picture of, of a man who gets done what needs to get done. I want to read you something. This is a speech. See if you know who said this speech. Of all the rocks upon which we build our lives, we are reminded today that family is the most important. And we are called to recognize and honor how critical every father is to that foundation. They are teachers and coaches. They are mentors and role models. They are examples of success and the men who constantly push us toward it. Judah, Othniel, Ehud. But if we are honest with ourselves, we'll admit that what too many fathers are is missing. Missing from too many lives, too many homes. They have abandoned their responsibilities, acting like boys instead of men. The foundation of our families are weaker because of it. No sacrifice. Not willing to do what needs to be done. We know the statistics. That children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty, commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison, more likely to have behavioral problems, run away from home, become teenage parents themselves, the foundation of our community are weaker because of it. We see the failure of male leadership at the end of Judges. This is why. This is what's going to happen. Yes, we need more cops on the street. Yes, we need fewer guns in the hands of people who shouldn't have them. Yes, we need more money for our schools, more outstanding teachers in the classroom, more after-school programs for our children. Yes, we need more jobs, more job training, more opportunity in our communities. But we need families to raise our children. We need fathers to realize that responsibility does not end at conception. We need them to realize that what makes you a man is not the ability to have a child, it's the courage to raise one. Anybody know who said that? Yes. Barack Obama, 2008. It's an awesome speech. It's even better to watch than to hear. Um, Ehud shows us what we need to be doing to get it done. Are you preparing yourself? Getting yourself ready? as a husband, as a dad, as a mom, as a wife, within the congregation, as a leader, somebody who's going to take us into the promised land. Are you actively working and preparing yourself to this end? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself, both yourself for this work that needs to be done and to sacrifice to the Lord and for the Lord in order to get this done. You're not going to do it by yourself. You can try. This is something we need to be doing together. Um, and we need to do all of it. Because if we don't do all of it, we're just going to watch everything fall apart as we turn through the pages of Judges. Next time, here's what I need you to do. I need you to read Judges chapter 4 and 5. It's the story of Deborah and Barak. And this is what you list... As you read through the story of Deborah and Barak, the title of the class is Where Are the Men? You've seen in Othniel and Ehud what men are supposed to be. Um, in Deborah's story and Barak, just read through and make a list. Where are they? That's what I want to know. Next class, where are they? And what are they doing? All right. Thanks for your participation tonight. Appreciate it.